All right. Do we have everybody? Excellent. Heavenly Father, we just pray for these kids as they learn more about you. We pray, Lord, that you would just fill their hearts um, with knowledge, but not only knowledge, but love. Love and kindness and goodness. We pray for Miss Fee and the, and the helpers as they teach these kids. And we just pray, Lord, that, uh, that Father, you would just be known more and more as, uh, as they learn about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Which is the first, which commandment is first of all? And Jesus replies, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. To which the man replies, you're right. And Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of of God. There's concerns within our culture that do not seem to be going away. You hear about it in the news all the time, but many feel powerless, inadequate, or lack the needed knowledge to do anything about it. The pandemic has simply amplified many issues in people's lives, and it seems the church or the churches in our area anyway. <clears throat> it seems like the churches in our areas do not seem to be a place of refuge or safety for those who need hope and healing. I often wonder if our church closed the doors, would our community notice? I'm going to gently name some things or some issues, and I'm going to lay them out, because I think it's an important place to start. There's sexuality and gender issues, which I don't remember hearing about as a kid that we have to deal with. There's pornography. That change. There's pornography. Just, just look at the statistics. It's bad. There's those in the church that aren't immune to this either. There's the epidemic of opioid, drug, and alcohol abuse. I see it all the time. I know many people who are struggling with it. There's those who have poor mental health, anxiety, depression, suicide, mood disorders. And now we have a housing crisis. Housing has always been expensive, but it's gotten worse during this time of the pandemic. There's a youth group that I help with, Greg Holcroft, and uh, there's a group of kids, or, or a family rather, that had to move out of Brockville because they couldn't afford rent. They now live in Smith Falls where the rent was cheaper, and their family drives them to Greg's, and then Greg brings them to the youth group. And there's many that, that just can't afford a house, can't afford rent. They don't know what they're going to do. Now, it's true that we're given to many, we are giving to many causes that help teach and aid in these issues, and that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. But... From what I can see, we don't have a unified, robust dialogue that remains true to God's word as we read it, and yet considers the very real struggle that many are dealing with internally. The government is trying to create policies and distribute funding to alleviate a lot of these issues. But half the population thinks the government is doing too much, and the other half the population thinks it's not doing enough. And there's just as many Christians on one side as well as the other. I guess it's democracy at its best. But is the church doing enough? Does God not want this place, the places of worship, to be a place of hope, compassion, and prayer for those who are struggling with these issues? A place where people can discover a people with an unusual joy and peace? Now, it's true that there's many who need professionals, and we don't have the tools to deal with many of these complex issues. But we can and should continue to walk alongside people spiritually while they fight their battle, which is really starts with the battle in the mind, first and foremost. Everybody has a movie or a script that's playing in their mind. 
This is the great calling of all believers, as we read in our first passage, as we read in the beginning passage. Listen to that second part of the passage again. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's been said that this verse sums up the whole Bible, and the rest is just commentary. That's powerful. Now, I think we do love God, and I think we do love our neighbor. I really do. But I strongly sense for many Christians that we could be doing more. Is this God speaking to us? What may be hindering the church from really loving our neighbor? Remember the last message I spoke about the three levels of hospitality, three levels of loving your neighbor. We love them through their lack, we love them through their pain and suffering, and we love them through their shame. But there's a lack of knowledge and grace and love within the church in regards to healthy conversations, coupled with an indecision to be an active participant in God's purposes. Rather, many of us choose to be a passive complainer, and I being one of them at times. I think of the story of Socrates that Socrates shared. And he says, Socrates was a Greek philosopher known for his great knowledge and wisdom. And one day an acquaintance of his met a wise man and said, I just heard something about your friend. Do you want to know what it's about? To which Socrates replied calmly, before you talk to me about my friend, it might be a good idea to test the importance of what you're going to say. Let it pass through the triple filter test. The first filter of your information is truth. Are you absolutely sure what you are about to tell me about my friend is true? Well, no, the man said. I just heard about it from somewhere. All right, so you are unsure about the truthfulness of your statement, so you are about to make. Now, let's try the second filter, the filter of goodness. Is what you are about to tell me a good thing, said Socrates? Uh, no, answered the man softly. So, you want to tell me something bad about my friend, which you're not certain it's true. You failed the first two tests, but you may still pass the test if you pass the final filter, the filter of usefulness. Is what you want to tell me really going to be useful to me? No, not really, replied the man shamefully. Well, if you want to tell me it's neither true, nor good, nor even useful, why waste your time to tell it to me at all, concluded Socrates. And Paul says in Ephesians 4.9, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it may benefit those who listen. There's always been a decline and a division within the church, especially in North America, certainly long before the pandemic hit. However, the pandemic has only amplified it, bringing out the worst in many. We're more connected than ever before with our phones, but often it's only passively through watching Netflix, YouTube, TikTok, and other social media. Most of us participate in these mediums, but far too many of us spend too much time in these passive activities and not having life-giving conversations that offer the graceful, grace-filled solutions and advice to those who really need help. People aren't running to our church nor the other churches in our areas. I think that's obvious. I'm not sure what's happening globally, but there's a major problem even within the CRC church. In 1992, it had 316,000 members. Almost 30 years later, the membership is at 222,000, a decline of 100,000, or 30%. I would say this is similar for most other mainline Protestant churches. Yet the U.S. population has grown almost 25% in that time. A study published in April, April estimated that in the decade ending in 2020, 4,000 to 8,000 houses of worship approximately 
close per year in the United States. At 75 or 100, 75 to 150 congregations per week. It's also projected that these numbers will double and triple in the wake of the pandemic. The biggest reason? Declining church membership. If people are coming to Jesus, and I hope they are, they're not coming to church. Christianity is divided. Divisions and factions are happening within the body of Christ. And we're noticing that many people are quietly exiting the back door without anybody notice, noticing, let alone caring. And our young people, our future leaders, are increasingly seeing the church as irre irrelevant. It has been said that most young people crave authenticity, but they don't know where to get it. The church is so caught up in politics, which is always going to be messy and worldly. But often the church is looking towards the government to be its savior. Many in the church believe that Donald J. Trump was the best president to come down the pipe and did more for religious freedom than any other president in history. Many in the same church really believe that he was a narcissistic president. His four years has consumed many believers, regardless of what you thought of him. I guess it's a cult of personality. Here at home, many treat, see uh, uh, Justin Trudeau with, with a newer vision, sunnier ways. And then there's other people that see him as the Antichrist. And often we sit in the same church. I know a large church in western Ontario that's hemorrhaging members because of a change in leadership. And it's causing leaders to be at odds with each other. Leaders can't come to a consensus of, of what's true. They can't play in the same sandbox together. And people, the common people, don't feel loved or heard. I heard a story, uh, a girl that I know, and she went to her pastor looking for some pastoral advice. And she went to talk to the pastor's wife, who, who was always there and was a real mom in the church, and... And so she went there and says, you know, what, what do I do? And the pastor's wife replied and said, honey, you just need to get into the word. That young lady never went back to church again. She didn't feel heard. She didn't feel loved. She didn't feel cared for. <clears throat> then we have pro-mask and pro-vaccine folks who are all in and believe this is the only way out of the pandemic. And then we have people who believe it's useless and an infringement on people's individual decision to choose for themselves. These issues, these issues are dividing many churches and families because so many feel so passionate about this. Somebody I know that just founded a company a, a multi-million dollar company. They got funding. But he, just, he just informed his employees that he's down in the Caribbean because he couldn't take the mandates that were coming down from the government. He moved his family down there after he started a company. I guess he can work online. And so many people who do not know what to believe or who to believe, are deeply confused, increasingly isolated. It's claimed that the reason for this is that we're putting too much trust in the government, or we have too much distrust, and the social media amplifies it. And many pastors, and I'm not, it's not Pastor Dan, but there's many pastors that are amplifying this as well. The world is looking at the church kind of sideways, wondering who these strange folks are who claim to follow a God of love, claim to follow a God that says, do unto others as you would want done to you, yet seem to project more judgment, hate, uh, us versus them mentality than anything that resembles self-sacrificial, life-giving love. So here, I named it. Now what? The world is looking 
<coughs> sorry, the church is to be a light in the world. It's supposed to be a city on a hill. We're called to make a real difference. And we are to be the one place where real truth and real hope is found. Besides, we believe in the one who created the whole universe. And we know that love wins. We know how the story ends. As Tony Campola says, we are to change the world that is into the world that ought to be. That's what we're called to do. As Reformed believers, we believe in Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone, and to glory to God alone. That's what we believe as Reformed believers. These are powerful truths. Further, we have a statement in the Apostles' Creed that we accept, as well as other confessions, that really sum up the Bible really well. We don't deny God's holiness and his coming judgment. We declare the cross, not the flag. We acknowledge our sin and need, forg- and need of forgiveness. And we trust in the goodness and grace of God, even though, or we trust in the goodness and grace of God given through the person of Jesus Christ. There's a capacity within our churches at large and in the church specifically in the form of talents, gifts, energy, motivations of various kinds that God has given us. Leadership, teaching, encouragement, intercession, giving, hospitality, mercy, serving, shepherding, just to name a few. There's those who can teach. I think of Miss Fee. The way she teaches at the school is amazing. The passion that she has, the understanding of those kids is incredible. And there's many other that have that similar gift. There's those who can make meals, who love to clean up, who love to send cards and notes of encouragement. We have those with administrative gifts. A great pastor can never really succeed without a great administrator. Clerks who know the fine details of governance and really helps to keep law and order and systems in place. There's deacons who have a desire to give benevolence. Elders who are great at listening and offering pastoral wisdom. There's those with the skill of diplomacy and the skill to bring reason to both sides. There's those who are prayer warriors and intercessors, and it's the backbone of any church. I heard of a church that started in the inner city of London, and somebody says it can never be done. The first thing he did was hire and pay two intercessors. Those were the first two people he hired. And that church has had a big impact. There's those who are carpenters and who have an incredible skill for fine detail and taking on large projects, tradesmen of all sorts. Think of this. 35 years ago, a farmer and a biblical scholar named Clarence Jordan had a dream of helping people get into a home. It seemed impossible. Today, almost 4,100 families in Canada have partnered with Habitat for Humanity to buy their own home. Globally, Habitat has helped over 35 million people build or improve a place to call their home. Their motto is bring communities together to help families build strength, stability, and independence through affordable home ownership. There's those who are really good at making money. These individuals are a huge asset in order to support the mission of the church. I've been a recipient of many people here and their generosity in helping me in my ministry. On average, religiously affiliated households donate $1,500 to charity annually, while households with no religious affiliation donate $695. There's also many untapped spiritual gifts that we never talk about because we don't understand them. Prophecy, healing, tongues, and discernment. These gifts need to be discovered and used well, but they shouldn't be pushed aside either. And I know that the scales are tipped more to the practical gifts, but they're still gifts, and they could be used to great effect. And they are used to great effect. People want to be generous. Just the other day, Heather had had a lady from the food bank that came in and talked about all about the food bank. It was a wonderful conversation, and it was for one of her classes. 
And one of the boys in the class that struggles with a lot of autistic issues and, and that particular day he broke his headphones. And he was in a dither and we, we couldn't even get any work out of him because he just could understand these are $40 pair of headphones, I don't have them anymore. I gotta buy a new pair. But at the end of that conversation, at the end of that training, he had $5 in his hand and he was reaching it out to give to Bernice. He said, would you take that? It was amazing. It was so touching to see that boy wanting to give when he himself was struggling and knew he needed that money to buy a pair of headphones, which me meant the world to him. It really did. <clears throat> Paul talks about the many parts of the physical body to describe how the church and how each of us uh, describe the church and how each need each other. Different gifts, but it's the same spirit which inspires us all. So how are we going to come to a consensus on these issues so the church can be united instead of divided? How are we going to love our community with the love and hope of Jesus and serve with all the talent that God has given us? If our church was forced to close down, we would hope that our community would weep. We won't reach everybody and we won't solve all the community's problems. But we can begin to see and believe what God can do with the church that's united and filled with love. United and filled with love. And I believe it all starts with a conversation. <clears throat> but first, this conversation needs to start in prayer with God. We need to talk to Him and listen to Him primarily through His Word, but also that inner witness on the inside of us. The first part of the verse that we read in the beginning mentions and talks about loving God with everything that we have. Listening to his voice, his heart, and how he wants us to handle these issues. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Read that whole passage for a second. Jesus answered, Did I not tell you, but do you not believe the works I do in my Father's name? Testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Many of you know how to hear the Holy Spirit and have experienced the blessing and the privilege and the joy that comes when we are obedient to that prompting. And then step out in faith and continue to hold the tension in the issues and the problems of the world and hold it in tension with Scripture. Because in the end, love, love covers a multitude of sins, said Peter in his letter. At Bible study this past week, Henry was out. And uh, it was good to see Henry, and he's, he's, he's struggling with his back. But it is getting better as, as he kind of works with a physiotherapist. To, and he shared this story. And I called him and asked him permission to share it. I wanted Henry to share it, but he couldn't make it because of his, because of his back at the moment. But just a couple weeks ago, he was splitting wood, and he just had this, this, this prompting that he should deliver a load of wood to this particular neighbor that's had a stroke, is, is really incapacitated, can't, can't get around. But he ignored the voice for a week, and the next week he's back, back splitting wood and, and stacking wood, and he felt that same feeling, I, I need to deliver a load of wood to this particular family. And so he did. He was obedient, dropped the wood off, the tears in that man's eyes, he wept. He wept. He was so grateful for that show of hospitality and giving. He couldn't do it himself. He couldn't provide for his family. 
Henry could have missed it, but he was obedient. The second part of the verse challenges us to listen well to each other. Is this not part of loving each other? The New Living Translation says in Proverbs, timely advice is lovely. It's like golden apples in a silver basket. But what is this love again? What does it mean? Let God remind us from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Our conversations need to begin with the profound truth that the person on the other side is also created in the image of God and deserves our utmost respect. Political affiliation someone identifies with should not matter. The color of one's skin doesn't matter. Citizen or immigrant does not matter. Asian or European, it doesn't matter. If we claim to be a follower of Jesus and believe that his Father is love, then these issues shouldn't matter in the slightest. Paul says that when he's weak, he shares in people's weakness because he wants to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some, doing everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. Most of us say, but sin entered the world. Yes, but we worship a God who came to correct this by sending his only son, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. His name is Jesus, love incarnate, and he lives in our hearts through faith. Do we really, really believe this? So with a cup of coffee in one hand and a careful reading of the Bible in the other, let's start to have life-giving conversations with each other and with those who don't know Jesus. Let us begin to search the scriptures as the Bereans, to receive the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures every day to see what Paul said was true. I honestly think about getting some people together and just memorizing the Sermon on the Mount and getting that within our, our minds and our hearts. In conclusion, we need to bring others into this conversation with Jesus, but they will first have to see it through us. In our grace-filled conversations and our willingness to serve our community and church self-sacrificially. So I'm not here to make any moral judgments on any of the above issues mentioned. But I will say that if we are truly living out the life of Jesus that is within, many of these issues will pale in significance because we come to realize that people matter. The lost matter to God. He doesn't care about labels. He doesn't want an us versus them mentality. His desire is for us to show a radical hospitality to our fellow believers and also those on the outside who God is calling. We do not have a say in who that is. We just need to go. Go in his power. We must. So can we have spiritual and life-giving conversations with those we disagree with? Can we have a conservative mind and a liberal heart? Can we hold some of these big cultural and societal issues in tension with the Bible and allow God to transform people in his time? So much good can happen if we are patient before we speak. Ask good questions and understand and affirm what is true about the other person's position. Not being so quick to assert our view because we think it's the right one. You might be surprised at what you learn. So with a good cup of coffee and a willingness to go deep, remember the most important thing of all is to continue to show Christ-like love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Amen.